We are back in all our splendor inside LAFC, the Max and Vince podcast, fresh from our trip to beautiful Kokomo. Wow, what a retreat. Just it was a, fantastic. I feel recharged. Yeah. It was it was weird that they made us be silent though. Yeah. I guess we learned a lot. We learned a lot though. Wasn't it weird though in these what two and a half weeks since we did a podcast, how everything's just accruing and we're like, we gotta talk, we gotta we we we're back on the phone and texting and saying Yeah, we sh- we have to When should we do it? We gotta we picked a good day to do it. Well, people might be surprised we're back, right? Because remember we we were banging the drum because we said we think Bob Bradley deserves to be back and so we were just sucking up to the club, but if Bob's not back, how did we get? <laughs> well, maybe we're not back. I was just doing this podcast without. Yeah, going. who knows where this is going to go? Yes, uh, off seasons are strange. We know that, and but we we have seen Bob Bradley, and we'll talk about this going to um, Toronto FC and doing what he did at LAFC. Certainly with Toronto, they're going to be much better next season. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about the roster moves which were announced here on uh, Wednesday as we tape this. But the strange part, and by the way, I didn't go to Kokomo, neither did Vince. I did go to Mount Baldy and just went up the chairlift and walked for a hike. Did you that's, go to Mount? <laughs> that seems <laughs> like terrible. such a. That seems like such a. Uh, it's the closest diversion. mountain to yeah. LA. It no, wasn't. I, it wasn't I did Bali. Go to Kokomo, but I went to Mount Baldy. I did go to Kokomo, but I went to Salton Sea. Hung out there for a little bit. I was going to go to the Salton Sea. Why? To go ATV riding on the dunes. Oh, okay, that'd be cool. Are you in? Should we do a road trip? Yeah. Who are you going with? I went to the Salton Sea once by myself right now. <laughs> oh, okay. I was trying to get my a couple friends who. Uh, who live in the desert. Let's, ju- let's dress like Mad Max and do it. Yes. Did you know at the dunes, just below the Salton Seas, where they uh, filmed those Jabba the Hutt scenes from Return of the Jedi? Well, that makes more sense why we should dress like Mad Max then. Yeah. The humongous, Lord humongous, leave the guzzoline, just walk away. Just walk away. Remember the guy with the... I don't understand Jabba the Hutt because like he clearly... I went like, to Mad Max. I pivoted to Mad Max. I know. But can I go back to Jabba the Hutt for a yes. second? So clearly it was you know, some kind of king in his castle some kind of ruler but like he couldn't move yeah so like people have been robbing him blind obviously yeah like it seemed like it seemed like once they decided to get rid of him it was oh, pretty easy oh, oh, it was pretty oh. easy to do it right yeah like i don't i mean why didn't they just do it <laughs> yeah, he did do a very good i like that little critter that sat in his lap like a little lap dog yeah like, where's his backstory where's his where's his disney plus? disney plus we got another we got another special that's what i want jabba's critter where is he now where is he now would it kill you if I knew the critter's name because I had all those Star Wars figures? No, it wouldn't because you normally know those very off the wall. Like you, you're probably like, oh, I had his lunchbox or something when I was a kid. Salacious crumb. There was no B in the middle, was it? A, did you look online, our producer Jason? Are you looking online? Well, you oh, just, Zach knows. You just beat me to the punch because now people think this was all contrived. Salacious crumb and his henchman was Bib Fortuna. Who had the Jedi mind trick. So in your face, beat you to the punch. Bib Fortuna. Bib Fortuna. You never trust a guy called Bib. No. Especially because he drives a Ferrari Testarossa in Miami. (laughs) As it's rolled up. On Jabba's money. (laughs) (laughs) How did you get this? And we're back. Like that scene of Goodfellas. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? Don't buy anything. (laughs) Don't buy anything. Get off the, take this off. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about it, but it's all very, it's, it's all very odd. I hope everyone had a happy Thanksgiving and a happy Hanukkah as we get into the holiday season also. It's strange because this MLS Cup playoffs are going on. We're in off-season mode. but And they're wild. They're wild. And I, I would be lying to you if I didn't look at the teams getting knocked out and go, okay, now Seattle's in off-season with us. And sporting's in off-season. Atlanta's in off-season. So everyone's getting an off-season. You're the only one from all of our postseason picks that's still alive. And listen, I said New York City and Vancouver. So my wavelength to a big underdog coming out of the West was correct. That's true. But I picked the sixth seed, not the seventh seed, mm-hmm. which is uh, we knew it was going to be crazy. Should we start in the West? Because that's yeah. where the West well, jo- is the best. I mean, Jordan Harvey picked SKC. And I remember I was like, you sure? I don't know. And then when they went up 3-1 on Vancouver, I get a text, KC. From Jordan Harvey. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you were right. I was like, well, I had Nashville, so they're still going. And now, yeah. now both our picks are out. But your, your data on Nashville was good because they don't want to lose a game. And they didn't. They, mm-hmm. they lost. They knocked out a penalty. They obviously didn't practice their penalties. <sighs> Walker Zimmerman, defender of the year. But, man, he skied one. Yeah. <laughs> Somewhere in the Hudson. Wait, is yeah. it the Hudson out there? What is it? Was it? It was in Nashville. No, no. It was in Philly. It was in Philly. I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's the Commodore Barry Bridge. The Delaware? No. Delaware. Yeah, it's the Delaware. Delaware River. Yeah. A couple balls out there in the When Delaware. it comes to <laughs> American geography and Return of the Jedi characters, I'm your guy. So, uh, yes, uh, they were not. 
I didn't feel like Seattle was going to do it. And sporting, you always see that in the playoffs. They And we've talked about it. They, they get they worn so thin, and they, they looked out of gas. Yeah. Second half against Real Salt Lake. Well, Real Salt Lake were dictating that game. RSL looked fun. Like, the second yeah. they brought in Anderson Julio, they looked fun. Like, Bobby Wood, Justin Merrim, they went for it. And sporting was like, you're not supposed to do this. And they just never killed the game. Uh, they, but they didn't even really have chances other than the penalty. Like, RSL was good. RSL was very different in that game than they were against Seattle, right? Seattle, they were just, like, lucky to hang on. And I, I guess you got to give Pablo Mastroeni credit, credit, who is probably going to be their head coach come next season because he's showing, like, he can – can chop and change and and they're doing it all without Rusnak who's their best player easily and he's back and he should so, be back Portland I mean it was all the home teams are winning and then the road team started taking care of it Real Salt Lake beat Seattle one way mm-hmm. where they you know we're, we're not going to even go into your attacking third and they did not and they took it to penalties by the way it should be the MLS Cup penalty shootouts because that's all we've been getting which I'm not complaining uh as long as the extra time is good and it's been generally pretty pretty good uh in these games, but uh, how would you say how would you say the name of the NYCFC player that kicked the game-winning penalty? Alexander, how would you Callens? say his last name? No, Cayens. Cayens. But it, the, how, it's the driving book, me the, wild. I know, but the, wait, wait. sometimes it is LL. Sometimes it, he's Peruvian. I understand that. It's driving me wild because and people go Pedro Galese, yeah. and he's Peruvian. Galese. It's but, driving me wild because. Stu Holden and John Strong are on that call. But I'll give John a pass, but Stu Holden is a part owner in what team? Uh, Mallorca. Yeah, how do you say that? It's Mallorca, right? But Not I, Mala- okay. Mallorca? I will say this. we got to look at it because sometimes the I players am. say you can pronounce it this way in the press guide, and you got to pronounce well, it. Well, you and I both talk to players. We'll go like, hey, we want to know how to say your name. And they go, hey, it doesn't matter. Yes. And you go, no, can you please? No, it doesn't matter. How do you this you got to do a Sean Connery uh, style uh, in The Untouchables. How do you pronounce your name? No, before you changed it. <laughs> Alexander Cayens. <laughs> it's a good show. That's what it is. So, um, and John, John Strong is meticulous with those pronunciations. So I get the feeling that maybe it's spelt out that way. I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. There are some teams that will actually go out of their way to put the pronunciation on the player profile page. His does not have it. But. So if that doesn't have it, then you've got to pronounce it phonetically. I'm almost positive it's Cayens. I agree with you. Because I reached out to. Good friend of the show, Andrew Quirk, who used to work at NYCFC. And he said and Cayenne? He, he says Cayenne. So well, there it is. He says. If Quirk He's says so. Good Peruvian players. You mentioned uh, Anderson Julio, and the Ecuadorian pipeline is real. And we have we have a spigot inside that pipeline right now. Is mm-hmm. that what it is? Because with the two Ecuadorian it players, so that's spigot. good. I don't know if that's spigot. the way I would say it. it sounds weird. No, it sounded weird. Uh, <laughs> that's more for a keg. So uh, that's good. But Real Salt Lake, I kind of like them. I like their chances in Portland. I like them if they play the way they played against SKC. The Seattle game was tough. Tough. Watching but that, was, a, the right, that was the right horse for the course. No, it was. I'm just saying just the whole the whole package, right? You're watching it in a football stadium on turf, and then you're seeing one team that's just like we almost had don't want to play. Two turf finals. Portland and New England. Well, now so. we have a baseball stadium final on, po- on possibly on possible, yeah. MLS Cup. I'd be down for it. It'd be something different. Well, so fi- it's Philly, Philly, hosting New York. New York. So it'll be at that, si- which I like. Philly, which stadium. is Sunday, Sunday, Saturday. You have Portland hosting mm-hmm. Real Salt Lake. Portland always finds a way there, and uh, I will say, um, and this kind of plays into our discussion about coaches, because we're you know. LAFC is in pursuit of a coach, and we're hearing a bunch of names, and some are realistic, some are not so. Look at the coaches that are performing well in these playoffs and get an idea of the kind of coach that you would need in Major League Soccer. So you have Jim Curtin, kind of went through the process under the Bob Bradley tree, Mm -hmm. got a a head coaching job pretty early on, Mm -hmm. he's taken the most of it. Yep. Paolo Mastroeni. Same kind of situation, both with very good backgrounds as players in Major League Soccer, translating that into a coaching career. Gio Savarese, not American, Venezuelan. But played here. Played in Major League Soccer, went through all the processes in American soccer to get that job. Ronnie Dial is the one outlier. Uh, Which is the exception that proves the rule. Right. So it's just good. But you had Bruce Arena, who's obviously in him. Because the point I'm saying when you're looking at these coaches, and I truly believe this, the foreign coaches will provide your occasional breakthrough but like in any job when you want to be successful you've got to lean into what you know Mm -hmm. you've got to lean into your phone book and the contacts you have okay I make a trade and I know so-and-so here and -and so-and-so I played with so-and-so 
you, you lean into all this for scouting and everything. And obviously you have a staff, but generally MLS staffs are pretty thin. Yeah. So you head coach has to take a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Just, I mean, look at the roster announcement with LAFC, just seeing like this guy's contract option and this guy's a free agent and this guy's going to go into the re-entry draft. Just the amount of mechanisms within MLS's structure. You have to have a coach that at least has a somewhat idea. I mean, I, I know my Matias Almeida has talked about this. He's like, when I first came, I had no clue. And he started to learn it. And his team is starting to get got a little bit better because even though it's a collaborative process, I feel like the, the manager has to have an idea because if every day he's showing up, he's like, why can't I have this? You're, you're just like, oh God, we're, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your energy. This yeah, is the way it is. That's not the way it should start. This is the structure. You can't, that can't be the starting point. Almeida's still there, right? He's has him now. Right. Interesting. Uh, Should we wrap up playoff talk? No, let's talk, let's do this quickly. So I'm sticking with New York City. I'm going to go with Real Salt Lake. I'm going to stick to my guns of an outsider because Portland fourth. Look, all all year in the West, it was the big three, right? Mm -hmm. Seattle, Sporting, and Colorado, and they're all gone. And now you have the rest of the teams, including LFC, that were in that pack from fourth to ninth that we're chasing. You have fourth through seventh. Portland without Seb Blanco. Portland without Aspria, who's I think is a bigger loss in many ways. Because uh, he does yeah. a lot, he does a lot, and he's fast. And he he does a there. lot, but but Blanco's the Blanco is a difference but it, maker. But the, together, the thing it's with a big... Blanco is you have Diego Valeri is a like for like. There's no real like for like replacement for Espria in in as much as he's played in the way he plays, right? For for Portland, NYCFC is going to miss Tati Castellanos. That was one of the worst plays I've seen in a big it MLS was, Cup. But it was also one of the worst refereed matches in terms of what is a yellow card true fisher by the way true fisher is officiating world cup games so he is the top mls official based on the the gigs that you are getting he is at the top the the whatever Bruce his, Arena was very unhappy he said it was they weren't protecting teams should have been Gale. unhappy the way he was giving out yellow cards for this but not that he waiting to the last moment then it was just it was there was no consistency this is all we've been asking for it's like we understand that this game, you know, the the American way of officiating is we don't want to be a part of the game, right? Well, too bad because players are going to bring you. Well into said, the game. I like that. We don't hear that enough. Yeah, players are going to bring you into the game whether you like it or not. Especially because we have players that aren't American. They play all across the world and they know the 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 shit housery that that you got to get into. Can he say that? In if he says I can say it. I can right. definitely say it. Especially if you put housery at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was someone's name. I we are the Hauseries. Yeah. Uh, but the, and you got to protect the stars. And this is a star-driven you league. You should. I mean, I I don't know how many more times I have to get on the podcast and say like we've got star players now and, and young star players. We've got great venues. We finally got great coaches. Still missing great referees. No one pulls for the refs and pro more than I do. I sit in their conference calls and they're great guys and they they come out into these calls and they take. They'll, they'll, they'll take questions after a bad game or whatever. So I know it's pro, uh, a progress growing there, and Howard Webb is in charge. And there, it, I, I love the fact that they are not like the school principal when it comes to VAR and certain things. Mm -hmm. But, man, how many, uh, many well-officiated games did we see? It was always a story in these games. Was it Kevin Stott with uh, the sport? Yeah. Kevin Stott should be nowhere near a high level. But he shouldn't. I mean, he's had a long time with it. He, did the, he was a lead official, and he's been at it a long time, and there should be a – a process of bringing in new refs and you have to be <laughs> you have to have your f facilities now across the board yeah i mean it, i'm not saying he doesn't but it's a it's like like football yeah, who else is there it's a young person's game yeah so i don't love it so who's your pick i'm going new york city rail salt lake new york city was my pick to win it all from the beginning yes it was mm, i like philly the two two tall center backs. I like actually if they I could switch system. it, I would probably switch it to Philly because they have. I like Jim Kirchin. The the. Jim, was it Tim Kirchin or Jim, Jim Curtin? <laughs> Jim, Jim Kirchin. You made him our. You made him our media. <laughs> Did I? Did I make him into the? I combined him with uh, yeah. the uh, the uh, MLB reporter Jim Curtin. Uh, I like him. I like they have a system. They kind of do striker by committee, which isn't great. But Shabilko can score some goals, and Santos, who seems like he can't score to save his life, he'll figure it out. Uh, and then the, they should be at home if they win through. So, was the layoff too big for New England? Probably. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about. They looked that. rusty. So, does Bruce Arena? Bruce Arena? They win the supporter shield, and what does he say? The supporter shield is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. When you don't uh, have a balanced schedule, which okay, I, look, we can we can venture there, but don't 
put down the the award that you won, celebrate the trophy, and then we still celebrate that trophy even though we win MLS Cup. I cherish those that night. I, I cherish holding that trophy. I think the Supporter Shield should have. Look, you can tell me that you you relish the MLS Cup more, but it's like one A, one B. It can't. It's not. It's not a. MLS Cup is so far up here, Sports Shield so far down it's here. That's not right. And so Bruce does that, and then they lose, and he goes, well, in one-off games, you know, you're not always going to get the best winner, and especially going to PK. You're not. Like, you shot yourself in the foot. You're not. Well, that's why we should understand that these are, yes, they're different trophies for somewhat different reasons, but they're still hard to win. You're saying Sports Shield should be raised in stature. It's 1A and 1B. Yes. Only I, one it, it, we're nowhere near wins. that right now. It's 1A and it's yeah. 2. They're both incredibly difficult to win, but both take different skill sets. And more than ever, we see the crapshoot that is the MLS Cup playoffs. I love the playoffs. Should I want keep them it to one, stay. Should we keep it a one-off? It's hard, but I don't know where you're going to put all these games. Final always a one-off for me. Final, maybe the first round a one-off. Maybe semis best of three. Yeah. Maybe, well, look. I'll, I, maybe protect I those higher mind, seeds. I wouldn't mind the first. They're going to expand the playoffs. It's yeah, going to be more than 17. Yeah, I wouldn't mind the first round here. being a one-off if it gets us to, yeah, New England should not be sitting for 23 days. Yeah. Like, the thing that you played for was probably the biggest detriment. Because we saw them come out, and they just looked... Their DPs were just kind of, like, moving around. They just looked stagnant. Have I said this before? I mean, Australian rules football. Aussie rules, you know. Okay, yeah. Eight teams make the playoffs. Don't do that gesture again. It looked weird. <laughs> come on, mate! Oh! How about this one? This is a better one. Yeah. I get for, those, for, those, right? for those watching on YouTube, so if, you, the, my, my, if you're, if you're only the, listening to the Ben's podcast, you me. really do miss out on some of the... The nuances when you if you don't watch a little yeah, bit hit on it, YouTube. Hit it on. You can just put us on your computer. Just leave us. Yeah, a watch wallpaper. it. We're having a lot of yeah. fun, and you get to see my wonderful, wonderful the beard. Bre- and Bredo's you get beard. to see. We're just only staying for one show, and you get to see how many times I hit this microphone during a show. The beard that grew many beards at ESPN. Tell me this. Tell me this wouldn't work. Eight teams make the playoffs. First round of the playoffs. One plays four. Mm-hmm. Two plays three. Losers have a second bite at it. They go Ooh. down. Five plays eight, loser out. Six plays seven, loser out. Let's say one and two, one. Three and four. Let's just say they're going by. There was no surprises. Mm-hmm. One and two go to the next round. Three and four play five and six. Losers eliminated and aided there. One and two awaits the winners of those two. That could be fun. The NBA did something like you, that. You for protect it. those top seeds. If yeah. they lose a the game, okay, we lost a game, we get a second yeah. chance at it. Doesn't it, the NBA does something like that with their final? Places, the final four places in the new in the new format in the new format they did yeah these Australians man they're showing us the way <laughs> many miles away from all of us but they are showing us the way the tinkering far the away. tinkering so possibly something that could work there and you protect it but food for thought and the supporter shield we should this plays back to LAFC we're all disappointed that year but it's hard New York Red Bulls won supporter shield after supporter shield FC Dallas won a sport never made MLS Cup it's not the same thing. They're different. Yeah, they're different classifications. One is the space of you are the best team over six months, which takes depth. Uh, it takes some some nuance, some creativity from your uh, from your coaching staff, from your from your GM. And then the other is just a sprint to the finish. It's it's what Portland's been good at. It's like, look, we can be not good for seventy minutes of this game, but in the the most important m- moments of the match, we're going to win no matter what. We're going to put our backs against the wall. We're going to win no matter what. It's two different skill sets, and I'm not saying that who wins MLS Cup shouldn't celebrate and they shouldn't think themselves maybe as the champion of the league. But it's it just feels like 1A, 1B. I feel like Mexico has it a little bit better because when you win the playoffs in Mexico, they don't really put down the who is the Apertura Clausura winner. They just say, okay, the playoff winner, and then somebody was the through, through that season, that half a season, is also the champion. They seem to have a little bit, I don't know. How about... Supporter Shield winner plays the MLS Cup winner for the title. I would love that to start the season as yeah. an as like a like a charity community, shield. Community, yeah, community, yeah, community shield. shield, which they did there in the year the MLS is back, right? They did that. Did did they, they didn't have like a trophy? They right. just they were the first game. To Let's do it, it, right? That's they right. Should, You're though. correct. They should do it. Uh, so we have our picks. I like Philly. I'll go New York City FC. But the top two teams in the East are out. The top three teams in the West are out. So there you have it. Yeah. Roster moves. Should we go to roster moves? Let's go to, do you want to keep talking about the MLS you know, you know playoffs? Everyone's just I think that was pretty thorough. Like, I don't care about the playoffs. I just want to hear about roster I know. Moves. We haven't been here for long. We have a lot to talk about. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to read it here. So they have exercised the contract options on Danny Masofsky, Carlos Vela, who had the option, mm-hmm. Eduardo who Tuesta, we'll more about. and Bryce Duke, and Sebastian Ibiaga. Declined options on Jamal Blackman. So that's obviously in the goalkeeping situation. You're looking, is that an option? Probably not. Maybe he comes back in some way, shape, or form, but no. Danny Crusostomo, Alvaro Quesada, who's uh, 
exclusively with the Las Vegas Lights. Uh, they'll be eligible for the MLS he was on the bench entry times. draft. Yeah. Uh, I think Jordan he did Harvey, make his debut at one point. Jordan Harvey, Raheem Edwards eligible for free, free agency. We had Jordan here. We could talk about where he wants to go, but it sounds like he wanted to still play a little bit if he gets the right opportunity. He was very much conflicted on what he wanted to do. Pablo Cisniega out of contract. And the loan for Michi Galina will expire. It did get a, a couple appearances for the club. 25 teams, players under contract. One goalkeeper, Thomas Romero. And then all those we mentioned. So we should start with Carlos Vela. Yeah. So there's well, this wait, is, this before, is me. before we go to Carlos, because Carlos is going to be one everyone wants to talk about. I think the picking up the option of Sebastian Ubiag is very smart. It was nice because you. I was honestly going into it. They probably don't. You know, he's a, an Normally MLS. They don't, right? they get a little more expensive. No, they're not expensive, but in comparison to what else is out there, for a guy who's not really a lock-in starter. Mm-hmm. So that when was jo- nice. I was. When we had I, Jordan here. He sung his praises. We didn't not completely not preempted. We need just MLS like, campaigners on this team. Yeah, and so. I think they're learning that. They learned that kind of the hard way. I think they're learning that more. I feel like, as we've been saying, there's going to be a lot of changeover, but I think one of the, the things that might be different is a few more a few more vets in there, a few more Jordan Harvey types, Stephen Bateshore types that, that know, and Sebastian's a good start there. Jamal Blackman, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more. It was weird timing for the time he came. and Didn't do enough. He didn't, didn't do, do enough. enough to warrant what his option probably was. And it was... Kind of throwing the, the the baby out with the bathwater. Kind of, yeah, we're sounding new, so let's look at a goalkeeper fresh and new. But goalkeeper uh, search continues. Let's so just Thomas Romero is the only keeper now. Yeah, on there, and it doesn't mean he's the starter because uh, obviously he was replaced by Jamal Blackman. But that's going to be on the to do list for the off season. We'll be here on Inside LFC, the Max and Vince podcast, along the way to let you know what everything happens because it's going to start churning here now that the business of the club really officially begins with these roster moves. Mm-hmm. So. Um, there you have it. Um, it's 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 not a fun business when you make these relationships, when you cover a club as closely as we do. It's not a fun business when you see guys either have to reconsider what they're going to do in this sport or have to pick up their family and move somewhere else. We, I really, we went through Beta Shore. We went yeah. through, uh, you know, Walker, all these guys. It's it's this process is so weird. I mean, I know it's 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 weird because there's always turnover in in football in general, but this is so kind of artificial, right? Like MLS has more turnover, I feel like, than any other league every year because of these contract options. I, I got to look into that. I, yeah, I don't love it. Like if you want to, if you want to release guys, stuff like that, I get it. But this whole like option, not option, out of contract, this guy's a free agent. Too many different tiers. Like we need to just simplify it a little bit more. It's exhausting. Um, but yeah, because it is exhausting. And sometimes a little bit of money to keep a guy on there, and like we, we're going through this whole process yeah. where you just and it's not like a club like, wants yeah. to keep some of these guys. It's not like it's as exciting as like NBA free agency. I mean, I know everyone's really excited to see this roster come out, but then you see it and you go, okay, that made sense. That made sense. And then I guess the only big one is we can talk you through what's going on with Carlos, but yep. not every team has that. Correct. And it's a unique circumstance. By the way, the players know what they're getting into. That's why I have so much respect for these pro athletes. They know that this is a possibility at the drop of a hat. You know, you're going to get uprooted and on to the next thing. And a lot of times the next thing is better than uh, the status quo. So Carlos Vela, it, this not nothing really etched in stone right now for 2022, but they do pick up his options. So what... What does this mean? What do we could tell folks about and where this it show goes? was one of the first to say that he had that option? Because remember, for the longest time, everyone was like, "He's a free agent after the season. He's a free agent after the season." And we were like, "No, he's not." We did our homework. We found. We talked to the right people, and they said there's an option. And then, lo and behold, in the last week or so, everyone reporting, "Oh, Carlos Vela. We've learned that there's a team option that they might." Uh, That's right. They might That's have. How we roll. So, Carlos. What does Vela, it mean? So, Carlos Vela's team op. The team option. What you have to know is options are different, right? So. At Twesta's team option is for the entire 2022 season. So for all intents and purposes, he could play with LAFC through that entire season. I still think that they're looking for things for him. It depends on what his will as a player is. Does he want to continue on to Europe? Does he want to go somewhere else? They'll look in January to try to try to find him something because within that year window, that's when you exclusively own his rights and you are the one that can negotiate that transfer. Carlos, his contract runs just through the summer. So it's not. It's a little bit of protection for the club because they still no other club can negotiate with Carlos without us knowing, right? We can give permission, but we have first right kind of a, a refusal in this way. So basically, it's only a step. It's a step towards some kind of conclusion, which is a new contract with LAFC, or he moves on somewhere else. And if he was going to move, it was going to be in the summer winter market. For no, he like could move in the winter market, right? So there is. He so, could, but it's summer is a much I more think, open marketplace. 
I do, but I think he would prefer to move in the summer as a completely free agent if he's yeah. going to move, right? That so too. I think really, okay, there's three options really. The first two are more likely, new contract or he moves. Uh, whether it's a trade transfer or he moves in January. The third option is he could still play, and then, yes, he just ends up leaving in summer. But It would be odd for someone like Carlos Vela, it, who's not really looking to make a big splash in Europe or a move. He's yeah, not. He he's 32. Se- and- when he doesn't seem to love just, like, temporary solutions. Yeah. Because that would be – that's why I think he gets – he wants it. He's probably looking at them going, let's sort it now in January. I'm, do- I'm here two, three more years. Play out my contract. I love L.A. Or – Let's find a good destination for me that works for both of us. You have the three DP slots. He would occupy one. There's no way to buy him down for his. Uh, the only, I mean, the only way is if he signs a contract. It's more for the younger players. Um, like if there's a younger player, they bring in a DP like with Diego Rossi. This new under 22 rule, maybe they they can make it work there, so they could get a DP to have a more experienced player. Well, if that's a direction they want. So to go. if Carlos were to sign a contract of 1.6 million. But right around that figure, you could buy it down. He could not be a DP. Even and that's not, it's not going to come down that Probably long. not. He's probably, I, I'm going to guess, ballpark, I don't know any any real numbers, between two and three million, two and three. I think. So he'll, he'll get a little drop down. Now keep in mind, all those people that, that lose their mind when they're like, how is Carlos making the most in the league? He had, doesn't even play. This hurts us. That money is, is, once you go into DP territory, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect really the rest of your roster. It's just how much yeah. your group wants to spend. Uh, for the 22 under 22 initiative, a player can't make more than the maximum budget charge, which I think is around 600000 But then the transfer fee can be, you could go bananas, really. I right. mean, look, if you bought a guy for $50 million, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't pay, he wouldn't take a 600000 contract. But if he <laughs> Wait does, a minute, you paid $15 million for me? You're paying does, me this? He slots under that 22 under 22. So those are the mechanisms for that. That is the one thing that I'm going to be very curious about this season because it does not seem, and hopefully we're going to talk to John sometime before the new year, I would like to ask him about that. Are we currently taking advantage? Or is like Sifu, un, Sifu or Cheeky, are they under the 22 under 22 initiatives? And if they're not, how much are, how aggressive are you going to be? Because we saw the team down south, the Galaxy were very aggressive. Didn't work out f- quite as well. I mean, I think um, Jolovich is a good player. I don't know how they feel about Cabral, who's their, who's like a full DP. So, yeah. uh, it, so it, it can hit, it's hit or it's miss. All right. It's hit or I miss. like him. So it'll be interesting. But- but yeah, Carlos, I would say, look, what was my prediction? I think Carlos and Brian are both back. I think they both, I think Carlos stays longer. So Brian would seem to be the guy, Mark, summer marketplace. There would be summer, at least a lot of interest right. the way. But the only thing, place where it gets weird is the World Cup's in winter. Are they going to make the World Cup? I don't think they make the World they Cup. Make, yeah. They had a horrible if, window. If Uruguay, does, a horrible yeah, if Uruguay does not make the World Cup, he's definitely gone in summer. I was looking at the South American teams and who would – so Ecuador is going to make it. Uh, we'll see if Chiqui and Sifu are part of that. They're going to make it. The goal differential, Ecuador is a plus 10. Uruguay is a minus 7. Mm-hmm. This is the worst almost of anyone other than Bolivia and Venezuela. So I don't know if they're going to – they're having a weird transition between the old guard and getting Suarez and Cavani, who you want to keep in there and get these young right. players, which they have a boatload of. Right. And now Tavares is gone. Yeah. Phew. 15 years in charge. 15 yeah. years. So I don't, I don't know if that's going to do it, but we won't know until, you know, probably March if that's going to be the case. But he's had a, he had a really good bounce back in when he was here in these last few games, and he's playing significant minutes for Uruguay. So there's going to be a marketplace if the marketplace gets better, which we hope it does. Mm-hmm. But, you know, who knows with new strains. And <laughs> well, I, think, I think they go into the season with two, like I said, two DPs, Carlos and Brian, and you will not see a third until summer as long as you have two yeah. i mean the thought that there could be one two and they're healthy two and they're healthy the thought could be one is pretty harrowing which made carlos feel well, think of like it, it made all the you sense got two in the world DPs. if atuasa stays technically he's a dp but not by name i mean you you have the talent and eddie segura you could consider as a, eddie segura in, yeah, in, as, in as, in as the, important uh, as he's been and cloud cuckoo land of defensive and if, DPs, and if Sifu takes another step he would be somebody that you would consider should be getting paid dp level money um but the, but that remains to be seen because we, we know that there's going to be a lot of turnover and it's going to depend on the coach. Yes. LFC uh, gets the coach. Uh, allocation money is something that's going to come into view as well. And it's going to be a fun ride. But 
First things first to coach. And we would imagine there'd be a, an announcement pretty soon. There's about, I think, eight openings. Four have been filled already. Yeah, and this is the shortest. Bob Bradley to Toronto, obviously, being one the of them. The shortest offseason in MLS history, right? You want This coach is going to need a full preseason. So you got to get him in before preseason, which would probably start the second week of January. So it's got to move fast. And in player moves, you want him to get in there, which tells me that it makes sense to bring in somebody who has a working knowledge of this league and contacts in this league mm -hmm. and can hit the ground running in many ways. Uh, should we kind of go through some of the names we heard, whether they are legit or not? Wait, well, before we do, let's let's get always ask him for permission. You notice that? That's, you know, I you do. bow down to the should. altar of Vince. Well, no, because I think I don't want to set him off on the it happened. Path. It happened in a weird time where we weren't podcasting. Um, I do think we should get talk about their we should talk about Bob's legacy. Just oh, I'm quick. sorry. Absolutely. I, I completely jumped on that. And uh, Bob, uh, just for me personally, we'll talk about it, was great. Now, there's things you have to handle with Bob. Absolutely. But that guy, every time we need something, said yes. And anytime you wanted a little time, and this is terrifying you go to coaches. Imagine you said this to Jurgen Klinsmann. Hey, can I have five minutes to talk about the game? He'd sit down on the steps there, the performance there, and we'd talk about it. I wish I did that more often mm -hmm. because this is a man with an incredible uh, resume, history, knowledge of this sport in every light, here and abroad, because he's done it. No one's had this coaching career in the United States. Maybe Jesse Marsh is on that trajectory, but no one can touch Bob. And it's not just the Egypt national team. It's not the U.S. national team. It's coaching in France, coaching in Norway, coaching in the Premier League. So uh, even if it's for a cup of coffee, that's something you, you rush on. So this is a this is an incredible wealth of knowledge, and he always made time. And I I, I wonder if we're going to be sitting here at one point going, I miss Bob next season. It's possible because he had this wasn't a good season. Players didn't respond that way. That happens, and uh, there you know. He, I have no doubts whatsoever he's going to do wonderfully in Toronto FC. But what he did in a tough situation, because it's not just taking over an expansion club. It is having a set style already in place for the club that you have to abide by, which he did. Mm -hmm. And he grew into that and created an exciting brand, was able to build this, this club in so many ways, a connection to the supporters, a connection to the city. Uh, you forgot it was a... It was a team that was in diapers, you know? Yeah. You, you really did because it had this professional feel to it. So I, I just, I know, maybe Bob does listen to this. He does listen to it. Bob, I just want to let you know how much we appreciated you. And uh, um, it's going to be, it's, there's going to be a void because of everything that he's done. And the Performance Center was a well oiled machine all the time. You saw so much. And it was open for us and the media to come. Guests were in there all the time to see mm -hmm. how this club operated. And the staff from Bob Down was, Something I've never seen. Absolutely first rate from the performance folks to the physios to everyone. Yeah, and when we say style, we mean kind of high level, right? Like yeah. style and culture, not just not just the four three three or not saying get results. Wingers. Get results yeah, and no, no, we he gotta play results, like this. But but he he definitely they you know, the club came together, they they knew what they were looking for, they they John had an idea. They speak with Bob. Here's the idea that we have. But the, the idea that we're going to play football and we want to go forward and we want to be uh, not afraid. I think courage was always the, the word that I took the most from Bob because I love that way he would say, like, y you can't come in this team and just kind of play. You got to have you got to have moments where you show your personality and be afraid or not be afraid to make mistakes. Step up, dribble in times. Maybe you got to beat three guys on the dribble. Then do it. You know, and have the conviction to know that even if you do and it doesn't come off, well, that was the right thing to do. I tried it. We move on. And my teammates are going to pick me up because they're going to say, that's the way we play. So when a guy makes a mistake, you go, that's fine. He made the mistake in the way we play. So we just move on. Uh, Bob had this ability to cut through cliches, which was the <laughs> best. Made me a better interviewer. Yes. Bob as, took as long my, as I've been in this game, I just. I, I, mean, a lot of, I mean, a lot of players have said this to us. They felt like they understood football and then they thought that they realized that they had no idea and Bob took their level up another and for myself included I feel like I kind of understood MLS but his worldview and the way kind of teams work in the world and the way he was able to cut through the BS and the cliches like oh we deserve better he's like no this is what happened in this moment this happens here and this happens here and I know that rubs some people the wrong way because they want kind of a more like hey we'll do better hey we're here for you heart heart of the city and I get that and Bob got that too but some days, man, he's just like, this is just what it is. And 
honestly, we don't have yet the infrastructure from our media in place. Um, I know people want all these coaches to be challenged. Like they want you and I to show up in a, in a post-game press conference and be like, why'd you suck today? Uh, that's never going to happen. Um, it's not possible. It's just not like you, maybe, but we're not close to it. Or well, no, it's never going to happen in that way. Like they want yeah. it in this way, and and Bob made it tough because he would literally in the first two minutes kind of tell you like this is how the <laughs> game went, and I would always His tell people thoughts. Well, I always tell people listen to those opening thoughts, and you can almost you can ask him a question to clarify, but really you don't need much more because if you then bring up a question, he'll say I just I just told you that, and yeah. that's the worst thing to hear from a coach. I I, I literally just said that, and you're like yeah okay I should have yeah. been listening, um so he made you he made you listen. Um, he gave you tools to think about the game. Didn't always have the right answers, um, but he definitely had answers. <laughs> you think he did that opening thoughts? To say, okay, I'm not going to get any questions because I laid it all out there. I go, I'm still going to get questions, even though they're repetitive. <laughs> I think he was trying to give people some things to th- yeah. think about and s- some questions because invariably Bob would say, okay, in this moment, this happened. There's a turnover there. Can you do better in that moment? Can you be sharper in this moment? And a lot of people to them, that seems – high level, but really he's giving you the detail that you can write about, especially if you're a writer like myself or if you're or you're a pundit. And then the people would turn around and go, well, what do you need to do like team spirit wise? And Bob's like, Ugh. it's like, it, that's the cliches. That's the BS. Like the team, I, I like I liked when he always said, well, you just go back to work because you do. You always go back to work. No, def- no defeat should be so crushing that you turn around and you just go up. Oh, Chalk it all out the window. We're not we're not doing this anymore. And maybe that rubs some people the wrong way. They want like they wanted the full changeover. They wanted Bob to be completely different. But that was not any that was never the the brief, right? John John and the club owner said, This is the way we want to be. We want to be exciting. They bought into that. They got a coach that bought into that. So if he were to then turn around and go, Oh, we're gonna uh soak up pressure, we're gonna defend with nine guys, we're gonna have just one guy up top. It wouldn't have worked, but Bob, it, and then just from the things that he did, he took a Carlos Vela, who we know all now know and love, and yes, he's had his injury years, but he had that 2019. That was not a given, right? I remember when LAFC signed Carlos Vela, I was like, that's a really good signing for the city, uh, for what they want this club to be, but question marks. Carlos Vela only had a couple years where he seemed really turned on. So Bob was able to take a star that, in many respects, from many people's perspectives, uh, didn't care, supposedly didn't care about things. And he turned him on to football and he got Carlos to buy in to play with teammates, to play with guys that were probably lesser, not probably, they were of lesser talent than him. Um, but he got them him to buy into the team aspect. And then on the flip side, he was able to make other veterans better, Jor- the Jordan Harveys, the Steam Betashores, the Walker Zimmermans made them better and took some guys that we'd never even heard of. Mark Anthony Kay. Latif blessing to a regard at Tuesta. Like he did Great all the point. things. It's he did really all the things point. you want a coach to do, right? He could coach stars. He could coach veterans and make them see slightly different and buy into a concept. And he made players better. So now when we go and talk about other coaches, in a lot of ways, I will judge the coaches on what they do kind of on that. Because I feel like he ticked every box. Because there is a lot of coaches that they don't coach players per se. They're they're raw, raw guys and it works for them. But they don't. And he gave these guys a, an opportunity to really take the as a coaching staff from Mike Sorber and Kenny Arena and Ante Razov, where they really were delegated a ton of responsibility. You see that in the trainings, you see that in the games where they have direct communication to certain players. Zach Abdel, where they have they are on on the hook for that. Mm-hmm. He's going to be the overseeing umbrella, but he has complete faith in them. And to your to your point, every single one of those players, bar a couple, improved. And whether they're here at LAFC or somewhere else are taking those next steps. And I think Mark Anthony Kay is a tremendous example. A guy who was in USL, yeah. identified and crafted. And he, Mark Anthony gets the majority of the credit because of what, he, what he's been able to do personally. But that was a story that may not have happened without that energy of Bob Bradley behind it. And with the co- guys from South America, which you have a huge cultural gap, they by and large have had those moments and they're still very, very young. They're still growing into that. But I know that that time with Bob will benefit them. You and I know plenty of coaches that would have been offered somebody like, let's just say a USL player and said, no, because I'm a professional coach. I need professional players. I need players on my level. I don't have time to hold guys' hands. And I'm not saying Bob held Mark's hand because to your point, yes, Mark deserves a lot of credit because they do throw the whole book at him. 
they don't hold their hand. They're basically like sink or swim kid, but they do sit with them. I mean, I remember sitting with Mark and talking with them about making half turns, yeah. something as, as, as minute as, as taking the ball in the half turn. And he said something to me one day. He's like, yeah, you know, you want to do it in two touches. I go two. Don't you, don't you, it's like one, you know, inside, you know, the back foot, the front foot go forward. He goes, no, I mean, if you can do it in two touches instead back of three, foot, go. Yeah, you can go and you, you can save yourself that much more time. And I asked Bob one time, Game of Inches. Well, then I went to Bob one time. I go, can you tell me more about that? He goes, ah, that, don't get into that. Like, you're getting into the, the weeds here and you're getting really inside baseball. He's like, but yeah, that's, it, I love that expression. Those are, the, those are the things that we, that we teach. He's like, and, that's that's what we do. That's how we make players better. If we can make them just that little bit better, and I I, I just thought that was great because I I don't think a lot of coaches. I've been around coaches. I've been around the Bruce Arenas. I've been around guys, and not not taking any way, thing away from Bruce, but at least to us, he did not make a forward, um, you know, persona of being someone that was talking to players in that level of detail. And Bob, uh, the the old dog new tricks philosophy never applied to him. It's about what is. Where is the game headed? Mm -hmm. How do we adapt? How do we get these things working where I can make a team look like we see in, in Liverpool or Manchester City, which is very attractive to watch? Uh, he embraced that. He didn't fight it. And he changed his whole his makeup and his coaching stuff. That's really unheard of because, you know, you always see these coaches. This is how I've been doing it for 20 years. Washington thought about this. Perfect example. Mm -hmm. This is how we're going to do it. Four, four, and two. it works forever. Four, four, but sometimes it doesn't. With a left winger that gets in on the attack, a Nico Ladero or a Brian Rodriguez, like Tabarez did it that way forever, and it worked. Yeah, but That's sometimes it's so hard to to move the, on. The sport sometimes. is changing quickly, and I think uh, those who roll with it will will benefit it. So we, we wish Bob all the best, and over in, in Canada and Toronto, I think he's gonna love it there. It's a, a city much like LA, minus the good weather. That uh, you, you have, a, they have a great, I mean, he said in his press conference, they have a great stadium. They're, great stadium. they're downtown. They have good great community. A, 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 you know, a cultural melting pot. And great food. Great food, which everyone's going to enjoy. Good Italian food there. Good Italian food, Portuguese food. I'm going to dabble on some Portuguese food. So uh, we talked about the style of play. We can touch that on a little bit more, but that's going to play a role here. Well, I think it stays no matter what. It stays no matter what. There's no consideration. I mean, so John Thornton is out there, and they're talking to these guys. Who go, okay, they're probably identifying guys that cater to that. And guys who don't, even though they're bigger names in so many ways, mm -hmm probably will not get that consideration. Maybe a, maybe a meeting, maybe a conversation, but they're going to stay true to that because without that, this all kind of comes apart to not have a team yeah, with that if a, vision. If a coach comes in and their first high-level thing is, oh, well, this is how we work against the ball and this and this, they're probably not going to make it. you you got to be a coach that comes in and goes, we play forward, we play fast, maybe we, maybe we do it in a more direct way, maybe we do it more via the wings, which would be different from Bob who wanted to play more centrally, but... It's going to be about getting the ball forward, scoring goals, and being courageous. So whatever coach that comes in will have to have their system be within that because it's not just about Bob, and it's not even really just about John. Everything's always been a collaborative effort between the style. Look, at the end of the day, like you said, Bob's at the top. He's got his assistant coaches. They funnel stuff up. He said, What he says goes. That's why it's his head on the block. Then with John, players, it's, it's always been a collaborative effort. Like It's not like uh, you got you have I've always known this like they look at players they they get input from the coaching staff they get input from their scouts they get input from the data people and they all bring it together and then yes ultimately John makes that decision but there's never it's never like John's like I'm going it completely alone and they don't know this that was one of the things that was interesting about Bob because there, you do get coaches that just say like just get me my guy and they don't care about but Bob would actually be a part of the scouting process yeah. saying oh this guy does this well this guy does this well um, so it's always been collaborative, and I think it's going to remain that way. And I think that's something that... That's great. I mean, what, what coach could you, yeah. would, would, would not mourn that to go, here are the players you have. Yeah, and they don't talk about it a ton, so that's, I can't fault people for not... As a coach, not, is that what you want? Yeah, for not knowing that. But a lot of people now are kind of like, okay, well, now Bob's out, so now we know this is going to go, and now this is all on John. No, it's always kind of been a really, really collaborative. That's going to stay. And I think you have to look closely at the, the coaching candidates that are out there and we we always run the impression it's going to be a wide net for this club and why shouldn't be they're going to talk they're going to have conversations but getting back to what we said earlier short off season obviously you want this to be a coach for at least another as long as bob bradley four or five years you kind of go into that um it's gonna have to be so it, it would benefit you in many ways mm -hmm. to have someone who knows this league who can come in here and go, all right i already have this mapped out 
maybe someone who's already been thinking about that LAFC job prior to the beginning of this season. Who knows? But um, someone that has kept tabs on this is going to look at, knows the, the inner workings of the system, like you said, not going to go, wait a minute, we can't do this? We can't. No, no, right. you've got to know all of that. I, I, we go back to the coaches that have done well. I think that, I think that there's benefits in this league. Maybe not every league, not the Premier League, which is going heavily German, mm-hmm. Italian. But this league, because of its unique set of circumstances, you look at guys, you have to have a base. You've got to have like a, a PhD in MLS. Yeah. So we look at that and some names... You know, they, well, let's just let's name off the four. And we there's can a just four. Kind of I mean, through. some people go, well, well, maybe we should look at Ralph Rack. Probably, by the <laughs> way, no, no, it's not. This. By the way, we're going to name four that like have been actually put into print and rumored because there's probably, I mean, yes. like you said, and it's other a wider people are talking about it. So I'm going to guarantee that they've talked to more people than Antonio Mohammed is the one, the first one that came. El Turco. El Turco. With a phenomenal history. Argentine player came to Mexico and parlayed that to an uh, excellent coaching career. One with Tijuana. One with Club America. One with Rayados Monterrey. An interesting coach because he wins everywhere he goes, but goes a lot of places a lot of times. He yes. doesn't spend a lot of time there, which seems to be the, the way of Mexico. I, I can't really fault him for it per se because it, it seems like in Liga MX, it's like, move this guy. Now this guy's available. Him over here, them over there. You have to adapt to that. And there's, I don't think we've seen some of the managers that have come from Mexico adapt in the same way to MLS. They're different leagues. Yeah. You'd like to think there's a lot more similarities, but we're not there yet. Yeah. So uh, the business of Mexico and how that works, certainly different from Major not League that. Soccer. So I don't, I don't think you can lean into that and say, okay, that will help the transition. Yeah. Because other than, otherwise than that, you know, El Turco does not have yeah. MLS 101 under He'll his know belt. the player pool, but he doesn't know the mechanisms, right? Yes. And if you put him on like a spectrum of coaches where there's the, the ultra – detailed tactical coach and then there's more of the uh man manager kind of um the spirit the character the culture coach he's more I, to me at least and this is why i reached out to people on twitter i was like tell me more of his tactics because well, everything i've seen he's more about the enthusiasm the passion the, the hard we, practices yeah hard practices we punch guys in the face and it, which is makes sense it's a very argentinian almost bielsa-esque way although bielsa is very detail oriented but that that machismo he seems very much to be a part of that more so some people have reached out to me and told me he had he has found ways tactically to change his teams they can be reactive which the monterey teams were very kind of reactive and then would hit you on the counter uh when he was at club america they were kind of on him for not being as proactive um but he can be at times he i, I was reading something where he he spoke about when he went uh to europe and he said you know i want my teams to play forward we want one two passes go one, two passes, go. Get get to the goal. So he seems like he he likes a, a bit of direct style, which could work for LAFC. But again, I think the majority of his coaching and the aura around him is he's just a guy that gets stuff done and it is maybe more so on his culture and, like you said, hard practices, working hard, you know, digging in. There's a lot of fans that maybe think LAFC need that. Sure. I, I would tend to think that that's worked a lot of times. Now, uh, his last coaching uh Stint Monterey did not do, go that well, kind of flamed out a bit. There'll always be a job for him in Mexico. He'll always get back in there if he wants. People are screaming for him as is. So uh, he will be someone that you have to compete for, I would imagine, more yes. so than some other candidates. Oh, yeah. He's he's definitely never backed down from a fight. So if you're, no. not, ready, if you're not ready to go, he will t- he'll let It'll, you know. That would be very different. And that, that goes for a, players. That goes for the rest of the coaching staff. That goes for the front office. I mean, he's going to be ready to go. So that's, that's the only that, – I guess not so much worry, but – you get what you pay for, and so... Let's go to the next one. Juan Carlos Osorio, which when I, was the first name I thought of when I heard Bob was... Uh, mm-hmm. LAC was parting ways with Bob uh, mutually. Colombian. Colombian. Relationship with two figures within the LAFC system. Coach Juan Pablo Angel at the Red Bulls took him to an MLS Cup, which I, uh, I actually broadcast that Western Final. I actually was at the... They played at Columbus Crew at, at what is now Dignity Health Sports Park. So there's a relationship. I don't know how great that relationship is, but he also coached Mexico at the World Cup with Carlos Vela, who scored a goal in the game against Where Germany. He, in the German game, he convinced Carlos Vela to basically shadow Tony Cruz. Yes. It like, worked. No, no, it worked. That's what I'm saying. But to, I can't even imagine to come to Carlos and be like, you're going to have to kind of sacrifice yourself for the team. Yes, you'll be the outlet in transition, which he was to kind of help for the goal, but he spent just a lot of time chasing around Tony Cruz that game. He it did. worked. Now... So, 
in the in moving towards the modern game, he is one of those kind of analytical type guys that will go in there. And I, I've had the I've had the, uh, the the wonderful fortune of sitting down with him, and he makes as much time as you want with him. And you hear him kind of, for lack of a better expression, geek out about it. He goes, "Oh yeah, we like to do this." So he is a guy that is looking forward, leaning, learning from this modern game as well. The MLS ties are a big positive. I, I would imagine it would be. It'd be crazy not to talk to him because of those contacts. Again, I don't know how well that went up in those situations, but they both had uh, good moments. Mm -hmm. He's had some great moments, and then they've had some really not so good moments. Right. You need a consistent Juan Carlos Osorio, but he's been in it a long time, and uh, he's got great contacts here and abroad. So I think there's a, this would make sense in a lot of ways to, to in a totalitarian, in a, to, a totally uh, area. I'm not sure. Well, everyone's going to base their perspective of Juan Carlos Osorio similar to the way they did to Bob based off of his national team tenure. So they're going to say, well, I didn't, if, you, if you liked him for Mexico, you're going to love him for LAFC. If you didn't like him for Mexico, you're going to hate him for LAFC. I would say that's apples to oranges because the national team setup is so different. And, and yes, I think maybe he tried to coach his national team too much like a club team in making rotations, things like that. You got to rotate in, in – uh, in MLS, you got to rotate in a long season. I mean, look at Peter Vermees in the Sporting KC team. They should have rotated more. Um, so a lot of people are going to knock him for his rotations that kind of kept Mexico from being a more cohesive animal and getting to getting to that fifth game. Um, but I don't. El quinto partido. Yeah. That's are you suggesting your, el quinto partido? Isn't that one of, your favorite, one of your favorite phrases? It is. It was actually a great jam by this Argentine vocalist uh -huh. named Carlos Cadizac. Yeah. Check him out. You can probably get his music on iTunes, but it was it's an excellent yeah. song. Is it free on iTunes? <laughs> it should be. <laughs> it, sh it should. It did very well. Should be. So though, but those. So those are the two main. So both him, both Antonio Muhammad and Juan Carlos Osorio, highest of highs, kind of lowest of lows, and they can do it in a really short span. So those are the two most experienced coaches that are kind of on the rumor mill. Now we kind of switch to coaches where we don't know exactly what we're going to get from them uh but we do know that we know that they're already part of the kind of the setup steve trundle steve trundle who uh we know nothing about the coaching surf i don't pry i don't ask questions i'm not here to break stories we you're have, not here to break stories we, i don't no. want to and we have been on the phone trying to get our interview set up with with john thornton and he's been so busy so like we yes. haven't even had a chance to even delve into the they, really they're knee them. deep in a coaching search so far be it from us to sit there we'll find out when you do maybe a little bit before uh but we were going to find out but to me, this is the one that makes the most sense. Not 100% timing-wise, mm -hmm. you know, this was a, a guy they came into groom, maybe need another year he did with the Las Vegas Lights, which was never a tenable situation with regards to success because you're having well, yeah, such explain, a nomadic explain way. Explain that because now everyone's judging Steve Trundolo solely on his Vegas Lights tenure, but I don't think everyone got to see the full picture and exactly what happened with him in Vegas Lights, and you can share. We can both well, it's share. it's a transitory like, a gig. I mean, you have a team. You have to field games for them, and every week we would get it. You would get it on social media. Go, these are the guys that LAFC are loaning out to the Las Vegas Lights. Lo and not uh, loaning, like, as in, hey, Steve, you can have these guys. Do with them what you will. It was loaning with the expectation that they would play. Travel, you know, practice in L.A., go there. Yep. Uh, and kind of – Put together a side with those guys that are currently on the Las Vegas Basically, Lights team. he's training with a group. Then there's the first team group. And sometimes there's some interchange, but most times there, you know, he has a small group that he's working with that usually would train after the LAFC group. And then to your point, five between like four and seven guys every week would be given to him, told basically to be slotted into the lineup. So he's never getting a cohesive group. Um, so that's why it's hard to judge him. I do agree with you. I would have liked him to have another another year of being the, the guy, making the decisions, thinking of what his coaching process is. Uh, but I mean, well, look at we talked about Jim, teams are diving into Jim to, Curtin and Pablo Mastroeni, who, who all went through that process to a lesser degree. He's done that, but a guy who has an incredible wealth of knowledge from what he did in his playing career got his coaching licenses in Germany. Germany is the 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 lion's den for coaching right now because there's vision and there's mm -hmm. uh, nuance and uh, moving towards this modernized game and uh, the high press that all that stuff is there for the yeah. so he's done that he's seen it he has contacts with regards to that in Germany here in MLS Hall of Fame player now we can say there as well this all matters good dude 
did get something out of these Las Vegas Lights players that LAFC leaned into. Mamadou Falls certainly at the top of that list. So a familiar face as well, which regardless of how you feel about you know blowing things up, that always helps the transition for players and a club across the board. Well, what about a guy like Danny Masovsky? Masovsky, and that should have been the, even the first one you yeah, should have mentioned. You, the guy who got that, they leaned in. You he being there every week, right? He, and somehow... Steve got his Bryce head Duke right. Bryce Duke got as well. Yeah, Bryce and Duke a lot of, moved him a couple along. of positions. I think what you get with Steve is you get a guy that, you know, when he was in Germany getting his coaching license, he also spent a lot of time with the youth setups and the academy setups. So he understands the mechanisms to make players better, younger players better. And, he, and I think especially if he's going to dive into that and that's going to be kind of part of his coaching strategy, he ticks that box, which I think is, again, I think it's so important. There's Players want to be coached, man. I know that there's somebody, they talk about it like, uh, you know, let, let them do what they want, like the – you know, you got uh, Pochettino there with PSG, right? And he's saying, like, these guys don't want to be coached. Well, that's Neymar, Mbappe, uh, Di Maria. Those are guys that are like, they, you can't tell them anything. Messi, you can't tell them anything anyways. The guys here in MLS, they want to be coached. They want to be brought up to the next level because they want to move on to the next level and they don't want to be found wanting if they show up to training in Europe and are like, what? I don't. what is this? I don't do it this way or that way. Like, that little nuance and bringing the player's game up to that just that slightly higher level, I think Steve could be very good at that. But we don't know much about his his football. Yeah, they don't do this, but you know they've done this in other sports. College football, I used to do it at Florida State. They had a coach in waiting, but that's that would have been maybe this year if Bob was around, and then maybe you come in there and he goes, "All right, we can we can put him in that situation." Mm-hmm. Ante Razov. Ante Razov. With the club last season, uh, not joining Bob my, in my Toronto. My teammate in staff games. Yes, we know him, Steely. Famously, with that exchange with Miguel Herrera, you know, people forget about the what we did at that the Champions League, the Concacaf Champions League. What an, another thing that you know, Bob had that team ready in a very strange time, mm-hmm. and we're this close to winning it. And hopefully, we get another shot at that soon. With Carlos, not fully fit. No, so, but somehow contributing. Th- did, he have, did he have three goals in that four games? Yes, and the one in America where they were trailing, and also they yeah. turned it around with Eduardo Twist out. That was. I mean, that is a famous game anywhere, anywhere in the world they'll be talking about that. We don't really bring it up, so I'm bringing it up here. Famous result for LA. So, Ante is a is kind of like Steve because he, he worked under Bob. A, a, uh, a, a tremendous career in Major League Soccer, mm-hmm. and he has worked alongside a lot of coaches, played for Bob, but also did that. It's, it's part of that Bob tree, which has been extremely successful right. in his league. Well, I, I think it's, again, because Bob's attention to detail. Like when these coaches move on, they they have a real fundamental base on a lot of things that they can lean into in in bad moments when they need to make the team better in in different ways, whether it's tactics, individual or culture. I think they can do all of it. Whereas you come from some other trees and it's more just about, oh, you know, he puts guys in the right spots to win. Okay, but how do you know those are the right (laughs) spots? You know what I mean? But Ante, so Ante will have been with Bob this whole time. I'll go back to one of the things that Bob said when we asked him about Steve. Trundolo starting and we said well is he, you want him to kind of coach like you guys do because you're he's going to be developing guys so is he just going to be Bob Light and Bob said no I mean guys still always have ideas and I think regardless of what people see Ante as and he was reportedly a finalist for that Chicago job he knows the league yes he will have a lot of influence from Bob but at a certain point there had to have been times where Ante would have recommended something that Bob decided not to do and Bonte would have done something different. So I think there is always going to be a change. Uh, the one thing I would point out with Ante is when it came to speaking to the young guys, especially the young attackers, what no matter where they were from, whether it was Danny Masovsky, Sifu, Chicho, Brian Rodriguez, yes. especially. Arm around Ante the shoulder. Ante was the guy. Ante was the guy go, putting them through their paces, sometimes giving them tough love. I've definitely heard him yell at Brian quite a lot. Um, he was the guy that in preseason was usually – highest up usually sat with us high up and was taking all the notes to go into halftime um so ante has a real technical mind uh but yeah we we still don't know exactly uh, we would think his football is going to be somewhat similar to bob's because i've you know, again my my staff game teammate loved to attack loved to score goals he'd love to do that in um in his playing days uh incredible left foot uh i think he's gonna f- he's gonna fit the mold of the culture of a forward attack be courageous. It'll just be interesting what what other kind of nuances he has if if he in fact is the choice. Could very well be that he sticks around regardless. Don't be surprised at that. Some guys that were on a staff remain there because they do a good job. 
changes happen in sports for a lot of reasons, and sometimes you just want to get some new ideas, and that's fine. And But there's some guys that do work within here that – You've already invested so much in that why make this seismic shift? So in Major League Soccer, they do that maybe a little bit more than other sports. I like it, and I think that's something we should continue to do because you've built that equity in that. Now, there could be somebody we didn't mention on that list. They're very well. We don't know. Yeah. It could be be high in stature, maybe someone you may not have heard much about. But – I think it's safe to say it's going to happen soon, and hopefully we can have these discussions here with the club and start moving forward and look forward to this exciting offseason. Yeah, we'll look forward to whoever it is, building a new relationship with a new coach. It's always fun, as you and I have learned from this past couple of years, so uh, it'll be fun. Stay tuned. That was a good podcast. And we That's covered good. a we, lot of ground. We did everything. I mean, it, f- it feels like a day ago that we were talking about Rail Salt Lake and Portland Timbers. Yeah. But there you go. But I think it was important. We have a lot of people talking. We want to continue to produce all of these shows out for you. Keep you on the on the up and up, which we are going to certainly do because uh, we love this club and we're going to continue to grow and we'll have we're back in no more breaks here. We're back. We we, 22 2022 has started. Maybe one break. Well, we, we probably won't be weekly yet, but we definitely we've we still promised you that we will be talking to John Thornton at some point to get that save the club and to get the real deep dive. And we we won't throw him softballs like everyone. People said that we threw him softballs last time. I don't think we did. I don't think we did. It's not softballs. I don't think we did. It's kind of like over the plate. I'm pretty it's sure not, we, it's not a it's not yeah, a heater. I'm pretty sure we went right out and we're like, why isn't Diego Rossi transferred yet? And yes. he answered. And we'll do that again. Uh, so we'll try to get you Thornton, and then obviously we will when things like this roster moves, coach comes in. Hopefully, hopefully if there's a new coach, we can speak to the new coach. But we'll be there for big events, and then obviously at the new year, then it's we're right back to the grind, Max. Yes. So, as we always say, please rate, review, download, and more important than all of that, share the podcast. Uh, a lot of folks listen to our, our year end. I think it was one of our best performing pods. A lot so of folks listening to year end on the podcast. A lot of people watching it on YouTube. And if you watch on YouTube, follow LAFC and follow 110 leave Football a comment. on YouTube and leave comments. And maybe Max and I will hop in. I will comments. get you. I'm going to check and I will I'll respond Max to it. I enjoy interacting. Max spends a lot of time commenting on his own personal thing. So, I guarantee you, he'll jump in. For this one, I do. Soccer OG. Check out the Soccer OG. Soccer OG. Soccer well. OG podcast and check out the Soccer OG Who'd on you have? YouTube. You have Kai Kamara. Max Paretos. Yeah. Kai Lovely Kamara. guy. You have Kai Kamara. Take a listen to that. And I'll be heading out to Pappy and Harriet's for a show. Reverend Horton Heat, Christmas time. Get your Christmas parties in. But be safe out there. You know what I'm talking about? Just be safe. We'll see you very soon. <laughs> <laughs>